With advancements in technology and forensic techniques, we are now more than ever seeing resolutions to cold cases and cases of unidentified descendants. But there are some mysteries we will almost certainly never see solved, as clues and witnesses have been lost over the decades, leaving us with only our theories. In today's episode, we'll be exploring two horrifying, unidentified serial killers from the 1800s. But first, I'd like to thank Switchcraft for sponsoring today's video. No matter what we do in life, be it researching cold cases like us or anything else, we all need a few moments to take a break, to find something your mind can absorb and your soul can run with. In the media-centric landscape we find ourselves in, it's easy to think these escapes come easy, that no matter where we turn, there will be something to get us away from the real world. Unfortunately, it's not always true. It can be hard to find unique, engaging, and creative outlets to really whisk us away to new worlds. Luckily, with Switchcraft, sponsors of today's video, finding that great getaway is no longer a challenge. Switchcraft is a match three, choose your own adventure mobile game, taking over the industry by storm. What separates it from the rest of the genre is its wholly imaginative, TV-worthy writing chock full of sensational storylines and over 85 charismatic characters, all coming from diverse backgrounds of underrepresented identities. Not to mention over 1,000 Match 3 levels filled with great gameplay sandwiched between scenes of jaw-dropping hand-painted visual in a modern graphic novel aesthetic. The story starts you off as a strong female witch named Bailey entering her freshman year at an esteemed witchcraft academy. It's only when her best friend Lydia disappears that the true, gripping, gargantuan mystery unfolds, giving you the opportunity to traverse through over 400 unique choices to find your friend and save the day. We feel suspicious that Naomi had something to do with it, but who do you think is the real culprit? Leave your theory down below and download and play Switchcraft for free now. Use the link in the description and solve mind-bending mysteries at your fingertips and support the channel at the same time. And now let's dive in with today's mysteries. The Austin Axe Murderer In the few decades before the city of Austin, Texas became home to a vicious, unidentified axe murderer, it was described by one journalist, Skip Hollandsworth, as, quote, a rustic cow town with a population below 5,000. However, by 1885, it had flourished, reaching the edge of modernity with a population of 14,500 people and it was filled with hotels and restaurants, attracting both the wealthy and the young. Around this time, however, the axe murderer appeared, causing chaos and fear for the population, and taking the lives of eight innocent victims. The first victim of the Austin axe murderer was a 25-year-old African-American woman named Molly Smith. Both she and her boyfriend worked for a wealthy local family, doing their cooking and cleaning for them. The couple lived in the family's home on West Pecan Street and lived an ordinary life until it all came crashing down in late December 1884. On December 30th, Molly's boyfriend Walter awoke, screaming in agony. Upon checking his reflection in the mirror, he noticed there was a deep cut on his face and he quickly went to clean it up. When he was finished, he realized the couple's dormitory was trashed. A trail of blood led to their outhouse, where Molly's body was found lying in the snow. She had suffered stab wounds to her face, chest, arms, and legs, and had been sexually assaulted. When the police searched the couple's dormitory, they found an axe coated with blood. Then, just a few months later, two Swedish servant girls named Clara Strand and Christine Martinson were seriously wounded on March 19, 1885. There were no other murders until May. The second victim was another African-American servant, this time a 30-year-old cook named Eliza Shelley, who worked for a Dr. L. B. Johnson, who resided in a cottage between San Jacinto Boulevard and Cypress Street. 
Eliza lived with her three children in a cabin behind the home. Her murder was strikingly similar to that of Molly Smith, but the brutality had only gotten worse, as her head had been split in two. Her blood-soaked bedsheets indicated that she'd been attacked while sleeping, and her body had been dragged onto the floor afterwards. Reportedly, Eliza's eight-year-old son saw a man enter the cabin in the middle of the night, but he was unable to recall any details the following morning. He only remembered waking up to find a man standing over him before he was thrown from the bed, covered with a blanket, and told to stay quiet. Later that month, on May 22nd, a third African-American servant named Irene Cross, 33, was struck while she was sleeping, except this time the murder weapon was determined to be a knife, not an axe. The first police officers who arrived on the scene were allegedly able to speak to the young woman before she passed away, although it doesn't seem that they gathered any useful information from her. Irene's arm was so severely cut that it was almost severed from the body. She'd also been scalped, leaving her with massive head wounds. In August, a young woman named Clara Dick was seriously wounded. That same month, on the 30th, a 40-year-old cook named Rebecca Ramey was attacked in her home. She wasn't killed, but her 11-year-old daughter, Mary, caught the Austin Axe murderer's attention and was dragged outside. She was sexually assaulted and stabbed through the ears with an iron rod. Mary died from her injuries just a few hours later. Meanwhile, her mother, Rebecca, had been violently beaten and left on the floor in a pool of her own blood, a deep wound on her temple. On September 28th, the culprit struck again, this time targeting a couple named Gracie Vance and Orange Washington. The pair lived and worked in the home of a local attorney. Much like the other victims, Gracie awoke in the middle of the night to find a stranger standing over her. She screamed in fear and panic, and Orange rushed to her defense, but the 25-year-old suffered a blow to the head with an axe, smashing his skull and leaving him to collapse on the floor. Afterwards, the unidentified man dragged 20-year-old Gracie out into the yard, assaulted her, and then bludgeoned her to death with a brick. He left his axe behind for the police to discover. The crime was so violent and grotesque that the Austin Daily Statesman reported that Gracie had been, quote, beaten into a jelly. Authorities noted their belief that he had entered the cabin via their window. Around this time, two other servant girls who had stayed in the same living quarters were also attacked, but managed to survive. One of the survivors of this particular attack was a young woman named Lucinda Body, who reported some of the odd things the attacker had said during his time in the cabin, including screaming at the girls, don't look at me, after he had slain Gracie Vance. Additionally, Gracie was found clutching a gold watch that didn't belong to anyone living on the property. The final two murder victims of the Austin Axe murderer did not fit his regular profile at all, and they were both killed on the same day, Christmas Eve of 1885. Susan Hancock was a white, 41-year-old wealthy mother of two who was described as being, quote, one of the most refined ladies in Austin. Susan was either sleeping in bed with her 16-year-old daughter or was simply sleeping in her daughter's bed alone when she was grabbed and dragged out into her back garden. Her husband was sound asleep in the couple's bedroom and didn't hear any commotion. Authorities found Susan's body, her skull split open. Like the other victims, she'd been sexually assaulted. Less than one hour later, 17-year-old Eula Phillips, a white married mother of one, was found dead in her back garden in a wealthy neighborhood in Austin. She had been sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death and was discovered lying face down. Heavy timber had been placed on her, possibly to restrain her, and some articles note that the young girl had been stripped of her clothing. Her husband, 24-year-old James Phillip Jr., had also been attacked and wounded. Eula Phillips is the Austin Axe murderer's final victim, as far as we know, anyway. All in all, he killed eight people and injured another five. Over the course of the investigation into these deaths, the police interviewed around 400 suspects, but none were ever charged. Boyfriends and husbands of the slain women were examined, but nothing concrete was ever found. James Phillips Jr. was, at one point, convicted of murdering his wife and accused of using the Austin Axe murders as a cover for his crime, but he was acquitted six months later, after a court deemed him innocent. Additionally, Walter Spencer, the boyfriend of the first victim, Molly Smith, was also charged, but was acquitted after a two-day trial. 
By the time additional law enforcement officers were hired, rewards were offered and citizens had formed a vigilance committee to patrol the streets at night, the murders stopped. They seemed to stop as quickly as they started. Despite the fact there were at least five survivors of the Austin Axe murderer, none were able to give a complete description of him. Some reports stated that he was white, others that his complexion was dark. Other accounts note that he was a, quote, yellow man wearing a lamp back or carbon black to conceal his skin color. He has also been described as a man wearing a Mother Hubbard style dress, a popular dress style in the Victorian era, described as being long, wide, and loose fitting with long sleeves and a high neck. He may also have been wearing a slouch hat, a wide brimmed felt hat commonly worn as part of a military uniform, or perhaps wore a white rag covering his face. It is generally believed that one person is responsible for all of these crimes, but some theories suggest there was a group who participated in and perpetuated the slayings. Several gang theories also emerged around 1885, proposing possible financial or racial motivations, but nothing substantial ever came of these notions. The most prominent suspect in the killings is a man known only as Maurice, a Malaysian cook who spent most of his life working on ships, but eventually landed himself a job at an Austin hotel named the Pearl House in 1885. Each crime that occurred did so somewhere near to the hotel, and the slaying stopped shortly after Maurice left his job in January of 1886, opting to go to London. This has prompted speculation that the Austin Axe murderer and Jack the Ripper are one and the same, especially as the Ripper crimes stopped two weeks after Maurice left London again. The Maurice theory was first reported by the Austin American Statesman. According to their article, in August 1888, a sailor named George Dodge was interviewed by Scotland Yard. He claimed that he met a Malaysian cook named Alaska, although it was possible his name was Lascar, an old Malaysian word for sailor. The pair met at the Queen's Musical Hall in Poplar, London, and Alaska showed George a double-edged knife, which he always carried with him. Alaska was described as a 35-year-old who stood at 5 foot 7 and weighed around 140 to 153 pounds. Reportedly, Alaska had said to George that he had been, quote, robbed by a woman of bad character, and that unless he found the woman and recovered his money, he would murder and mutilate every Whitechapel woman he met. An author named Shirley Harrison believes the Austin Axe murderer, also dubbed the Servant Girl Annihilator by a writer at the time, was the same man as Jack the Ripper, but that his true identity was James Maybrick, a Liverpool cotton merchant who was in Austin on the dates the crimes occurred. He died in 1889. Reportedly, his own journals include confessions of killing sex workers, and he even signed a page, Jack the Ripper. The most recent theory as to the identity of the perpetrator came in 2014, when a PBS show named History Detectives aired an episode on the slayings. Using a combination of historical research and modern techniques, including psychological and geographical profiling, the show identified a suspect, a 19-year-old African-American cook named Nathan Elgin. Elgin reportedly worked near the crime scenes and was missing his little toe, causing him to leave an impression similar to that of a print left by the Austin Axe murderer. In February of 1886, Elgin was shot and killed by the police while attempting to assault a woman with a knife. But despite all these theories and potential suspects, the Austin Axe murderer continues to remain unidentified. The Denver Strangler. The Denver Strangler, also known as Jack the Strangler and the Strangler of Denver, operated in the years between 1894 and 1903 and had less than a handful of victims. The Strangler often targeted sex workers and there have been numerous theories as to his identity over the years. The perpetrator's first victim was 37-year-old Lena Tapper, a French sex worker who had previously lived in Heron Lake, Minnesota before moving to Denver. She was the girlfriend of a man named Richard Damadi, and the pair were a part of a French secret organization that has been described as part of the French underground, which trafficked humans. On September 3rd, 1894, Lena was found choked to death on her bed in her Market Street residence. Authorities were unable to find any kind of motive for the crime. Marie Contessoy was 23 years old when she became the Strangler's second victim. 
like Lena, Marie was a French sex worker and part of the same organization, as was her boyfriend, Tony Sanders. She was found dead on her bed, having been strangled to death with a small section of cord that was so tightly drawn it was buried into the young woman's flesh, and there were finger marks on her neck. Marie was generally considered to be a wealthier woman, and it was for this reason her murder was determined to have been motivated by robbery, as she was found with only 75 cents on her. Five men were arrested for Marie's murder, with one of them being Lena Tapper's boyfriend, Richard Damadi, who reportedly flirted with and made advances towards her. However, all of the men were dismissed due to a lack of evidence. Two men in particular were highly suspicious, but authorities were unable to connect them to the crime. Antonio Santa Pietro had previously worked for the police, but had, for unknown reasons, been dismissed from the force. He was working as a messenger at the time of the homicide, and Marie appeared to prefer him over another man named Emile Tamens, a cook who worked for the 23-year-old and was described as being jealous of Antonio. Both men were allegedly in Marie's home when she was slain, but told police they heard no disturbance and nothing suspicious. The men were released due to a lack of evidence. The third and final victim of the Strangler was a 24-year-old Japanese immigrant named Kiku Oyama, who arrived in Chicago during a world fair named the World's Columbian Exposition. It was here that Kiku became acquainted with Imi Oyama, a cook, and the pair started a relationship before moving to Denver together in 1893. A few days before Kiku's death, the police had raided the local prostitution business and arrested several of her associates. She secured their release while being aided by a French saloon keeper, but he later demanded money as a reward, and the two got into a fight. It is unclear if this man was ever cleared of any involvement in her subsequent murder. Kiku was last seen alive on November 13th. She took a short walk with her friends before returning home and taking a nap with her curtains drawn. Imi then decided to go for a walk. When he returned, he found Kiku lying in her bed with a towel around her neck. She was still alive and gasping for air, and Imi pulled the towel off her before running across the street to yell for help from the other Japanese women who lived nearby. His shouts attracted the attention of a police officer who entered the room with them. By this time, Kiku was dead. There was clear evidence that a struggle had occurred, as Kiku's bedsheets were disturbed and covered with blood. Additionally, a second damp towel was found lying on the washstand, and it was obvious that the perpetrator had been rifling through the 24-year-old's drawers, likely looking for cash. The keys to both the front and back of the house were missing, and Kiku had finger marks near her windpipe, as well as some bruising on her forehead. It was theorized that she had been thrown onto her back on the bed after the towel had been tied around her neck. Imi, along with several Japanese women, were arrested for the crime, but a lack of evidence led to their release. In the years following Kiku's death, two other women were murdered by strangulation, and no one was ever charged with the crimes. It has been suggested that these two women were also victims of the Denver Strangler. The first victim was Julia Vogt, a 40-year-old psychic medium living on Champa Street. She had previously told investigators that she had been given a description of the Strangler by spirits who had reached out to her. On October 7, 1898, she was found dead in her apartment, a towel tied tightly around her neck. It is possible that this crime was carried out by a copycat killer, or somebody who wanted to throw suspicion off themselves. But it has also been theorized that the Denver Strangler came after Julia, fearing that she knew too much or would be able to identify him. The second victim was 20-year-old Mabel Brown, who was found dead in her home on Market Street in 1903, her hands tied with a pair of suspenders, a handkerchief in her mouth, and strangulation marks on her throat. Like the other victims of the Strangler, she was found on top of her bed. It should be noted, however, that there were other suspects in both of these cases. Julia's husband believed that an African-American man named George Randall was guilty, as Randall was always borrowing money from Julia. However, he was acquitted of any wrongdoing. As for Mabel, she reportedly had two men fighting for her affections at the time of her death, Harry Chalice and Samuel Holzweig, although it doesn't appear that either one of them was ever charged with the crime. Following the initial three murders, there were numerous suspects in the case, although none were ever charged. The first suspect was Richard Damadi, Lena Tapper's boyfriend who worked as a landlord. Local rumors at the time claimed that he was a violent man, 
but the evidence pointing towards him was circumstantial at best. Despite this, he was considered the most promising strangler, according to the morning news. Prosecutors felt that they could get a successful conviction, at least in Lena's case, while detectives listened to the ravings of his sister, who was imprisoned at the county hospital after allegedly going mad following her brother's arrest. She claimed to see the ghosts of the victims of the strangler. Eventually, Damadi was charged with Lena's death. A total of 45 witnesses were brought in to testify, and two of the alleged witnesses, a man and a woman, claimed to have seen Lena struggling with Damadi through their window. Ultimately, however, a jury acquitted him, and after the trial, he moved to Brazil. The second suspect in the case was a married French-Canadian man named Frank Rock. He was arrested because he matched the description of a man running from Kiku Oyama's crime scene. Reportedly, he had even associated with the French underground human traffickers in the past, but eventually, Rock was dismissed when authorities failed to obtain a confession. Next, an Italian man, named only as H. Mella, was suspected of being the strangler, when on November 8th, 1894, he strangled a woman named Marie Vendres, who was, thankfully, able to escape. He attempted to cut her throat with a razor, but was thwarted by a police officer who arrived on the scene. The morning call reported that Police Chief Armstrong did not believe Mella was the strangler, though, and so it appears he was never charged in connection with those murders. Victor Monchereau was a 40-year-old French carpenter who came to the attention of police when a former friend of his, Alphonse Lemaire, drunkenly told a story about how he had committed the crimes. One day, Lemaire entered a saloon, half drunk, sat down, and began listening to a conversation that Tony Sanders, the boyfriend of the second strangler victim, Marie, was having with a friend about the string of crimes. Lemaire then told Tony that the perpetrator was a man he knew. Upon being fed more alcohol, he expanded on this, revealing the name Victor Monchereau and claiming that the pair had met while serving time in San Quentin State Prison, California. He then said Monchereau arrived in Denver in 1893, three months before the crime spree began. Lemaire claimed Monchereau strangled all the women with the use of chloroform before robbing them. He reportedly even attempted to kill another woman, named only as Zevier, but failed, although Zevier did not report the incident to the police. However, that's not where this story ends. When Victor Monchereau got wind of Alphonse Lemaire's story, he replied by claiming that Lemaire was the true strangler. For a time, authorities didn't think either man was the true culprit, but eventually they felt that Lemaire was the one who was responsible. Monchereau claimed Lemaire was a vagabond sailor who arrived in Denver from Salt Lake City, Utah, under his real name, Charles Guichard. The pair met in prison, and afterwards, Monchereau traveled to Denver in search of employment. Lemaire was arrested by Tony Sanders after he told his story at the saloon, and eventually Monchereau was arrested too. In prison, he claimed that Lemaire was the one killing women with towels and chloroform so that he could steal their money. However, it appears that neither man was ever convicted of these horrific crimes. Unlike the majority of old historic cases, the Denver Strangler has a whole host of suspects, yet none of them has ever helped solve the puzzle. In both of the cases we discussed today, there are still no answers over a century later. Nonetheless, they remain some of the most terrifying mysteries in the history of true crime. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.